is because uh, March 16th, 2017 is the 50th anniversary of the Echo flight shutdown. Malmstrom Air Force Base, Montana. Uh, now this involves UFOs. I know some of you are skeptical. Some of you are convinced uh, the reality of it. Uh, but those skeptics, I think, uh, is what this is intended for. Uh, I'll start my story back in 1994. Um, I was in Seattle, Washington, uh, going through a bookstore, and I happened to pick up this book. It's called Buck Top Secret by Timothy Good. Uh, and I was browsing through the pages, as I usually do. I happened to turn to page 301, and I was able to read this small paragraph. I'll read part of it to you. In the spring of 1966, the command status consoles uh, at a launch control center in Great Falls, Montana, indicated that a fault existed in each of the 10 missiles simultaneously. It goes on to say that um, the missiles were shut down and uh, it also talks about an identical incident that occurred the week of 20th of March, 1967. Uh, it mentions the name of Ray Fowler. So this was written by Timothy Good, but he got the information from a man named Ray Fowler. So I want to emphasize um, Here's a couple of people that got involved, and this is not just my story, but it's a, it involves a lot of people who took the time and commitment to get involved in telling this story. I'm gonna let me tell you a little bit about uh, Ray Fowler, uh, one of my heroes. <laughs> if it hadn't been for Ray Fowler, Timothy Good couldn't have written this story in his book, even though it was a short paragraph. And uh, I wouldn't be here today telling you about it because it probably would have been uh, hidden from the public. Uh, you see, I was um, ordered, me and my commander, Fred Mywald, were ordered never to talk about what happened in uh, March of 1967. But back to Ray. He's an interesting character. Hopefully he's still alive. <laughs> but. Uh, he was involved in UFOs to the, at the time of the incident. He was um, uh, involved with a, a group that was studying the subject. But he was also working for Sylvania at the time. Sylvania had a contract with the Air Force on the Miniman missile and uh, the electrical contract. And he had people working for him that were at Malmstrom Air Force Base in uh, March of 1967. Uh, when the Echo flight incident, which I'll speak about later, occurred March 16th, 67, uh, his people notified Ray that this was indeed a UFO event. And um, in fact, one of his people had actually seen the object. Uh, Ray kept this quiet for some time. Um, he had uh, his job to be concerned about and uh, so, Ray did not discuss this, what he had heard, uh, until about 1972. Uh, in fact, Ray had contacted the uh, Condon investigators, uh, a man by the name of uh, Roy Craig was the chief investigator. Uh, shortly after this occurred, the uh, Echo flight shut down. Uh, now, the Condon investigators Investigation was uh, University of Colorado uh, investigation on UFOs uh, started in 1966. I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, but Ray, with his interest in UFOs, uh, contacted the uh, Con investigation team and told them about the Echo and Oscar incidents. Uh, we'll we'll get into that a little bit more later, but. Uh, because the Con investigation did not follow through uh, and investigate the, these incidents thoroughly or issue a report on what they discovered, uh, Ray decided to go public in 1972. 
And at that time, he gave an interview to the Christian Science Monitor, I believe it was 72. Um, and that's how the story was actually written early on, 1972. And I think that's where Timothy Good got the story to publish. In his so, book. Mr. Fowler, thank you. If it wasn't for you, uh, I couldn't tell this story. After I read this paragraph in uh, Timothy Good's book, uh, I immediately got uh, the thought that uh, maybe the Air Force declassified this incident and I could go ahead and start talking about it uh, if given the opportunity. Um, uh, I decided to try to get some documents to back me up. Uh, and by the way, um, the incident was still very hazy at this time in my mind because um, so much time had gone by. I had um, made a conscious effort to try to forget some of the details because uh, I was obliged never to talk about it in writing. So first thing I did was uh, contact MUFON and uh, see if I could get an investigator to try. MUFON is a mutual UFO network. Uh, try to get some help in getting these documents, uh, submitting a what's called a Freedom of Information uh, Act request. And that's when I met James Klotz. James Klotz, hands down, the best UFO investigator I ever met. Uh, we started collecting documents from the Air Force under the Freedom of Information Act back in 1994. Uh, I asked James not to uh, mention UFOs and um, I just ask for any documentation uh, the Air Force might have on the Echo Flight incident. At that time, it was my belief that I had been at the Echo Flight because of the way it was described in uh, Above Top Secret. Uh, so the Air Force wrote back and said uh, this was a classified incident, however, it's been passed, I think, the 12-year uh, limitation for holding it as classified, and they decided to go ahead and release some documents on the Echo Flight shutdown. And that is, when I, we received those, uh, that's when I decided to go forward with this story. And it's been a long journey. I've talked about this for over 20 years now, uh, and I think I uncovered uh, quite a bit of information and facts, which I'll relay to you. Uh, first part of this will be um, discussing the Echo Flight incident. Uh, and uh, I'll present here a recording by Colonel Walt Fiegel, who uh, happened to be there when this Echo Flight incident occurred. He'll just heard by Colonel Fiegel uh, was made back uh, about 20 years ago when I spoke to him for the first time and um, got the basic details of the Echo incident. In the ensuing years I've gotten to uh, learn quite a bit more about this incident. My purpose is to present a visual video record of as much detail as I can provide about the Echo and the Asker flight incidents. So I hope you'll bear with me. I'll be um, showing you a lot of documents, uh, 
but I'll be explaining along the way uh, what was going on in the background uh, as far as the cover-up and uh, other interesting facts about these important cases. In the previous episode, I played an audio recording uh, by Colonel Fiegel about the Echo incident. Right after that call with uh, Colonel Fiegel, uh, he contacted Eric Carlson, who has, uh, was his commander in the capsule at the time of the incident. I happen to have gotten a hold of uh, Carlson's contact information. Uh, and I want to show you the letter I received from Eric Carlson, uh, who essentially validated what uh, Colonel Fiegel uh, just You'll note here that uh, Eric Carlson confirms that he spoke with Walt after I spoke with him and essentially stated uh, that Walt and he were in agreement as to the events of the morning of March 16th. This is Don Crawford, uh, Colonel Crawford, retired now, uh, but he did send me a letter uh, soon after I started the investigation here on the Echo Flight incident. Here's that letter. The letter shows uh, that there were incidents uh, prior to the Echo Flight shutdown. Um, clearly, uh, objects were being seen around the launch facilities uh, in the weeks prior to uh, March 16th. One of the first documents we received from the Air Force under the Freedom of Information Act was this uh, telex that stated the announcement of all 10 missiles in echo flight going down within 10 seconds of each other. Uh, and it was uh, very unusual. They could not understand why this happened. They, they noted that each of the guidance and control computers uh, in all the missiles separately had to shut down. And it also mentions that this is of grave concern to SAC headquarters. This telex basically kicked off a highly secret uh, investigation of the shutdowns, as you will see in, in subsequent documents. Another document we received was called the Unit History for the 341st uh, Wing. And it, it mentions briefly the possibility uh, that this was caused by UFOs, but then, of course, says these ru were rumors that were disproven. Well, I don't know how you disprove a rumor, but uh, the next document will speak to this. One of the first solid indications we got that there was an ongoing cover-up was this letter from David Gamble, who uh, actually authored the uh, unit history that I just showed you. In here, he says uh, he doesn't remember anything about uh, rumors of UFOs being disproven. And he adds that um, there were a couple of times when editorial changes were made to this unit document. Uh, one of those was when UFOs were cited. So this was not the first instance, and it shows that there was an ongoing cover-up of this phenomenon. In response to that telex sent out by SAC headquarters about the importance of this investigation, uh, Boeing set up a team. Uh, Bob Kaminsky was the team leader. He uh, sent us a letter uh, explaining what went on in that investigation. He indicates here that he did not file a final report, and the reason will become evident here shortly. Um, the Investigative team did not find anything significant to report. They could not explain it. Uh, but meanwhile, they were also told that this was a UFO event. And this came from many people in the field who had seen the objects actually uh, during uh, one of the incidents at one of the launch facilities. Uh, they were later told not to write a final report, which was very strange because Boeing, of course, had the contract to... Uh, investigate this, uh, but it'll become more evident in the next segment. In this episode, we'll get into the heart of the cover-up that was going on. Uh, I, I call it a collusion between the current committee and the Air Force 
at the time of the Echo and Oscar flight graph of Dr. Edward Condon, who was awarded a contract uh, for study of UFOs by the Air Force in 1966. It was a so-called scientific investigation. It was neither a scientific nor a thorough investigation. The Air Force study awarded the University of Colorado was supposed to be a cooperative effort and uh, full cooperation from the Air Force. In fact, it was not. This letter was written by J. Edgar Hoover. And in it, it states categorically that he believes Condon to be uh, no less than a Soviet agent. A little more of the history of Edward Condon. 1943, he was uh, on the Manhattan Project, the first atom bomb project, but had to leave uh, due to some security violation not known. Uh, in 1946, he was appointed by Harry Truman to head up the National Bureau of Standards. Uh, at that time, they handled uh, nuclear weapons projects. Uh, 1949, he was accused by J. Edgar Hoover as being a Soviet spy, and the ensuing uh, investigation of that, he lost his security clearance. In 1966, he was approached by the Air Force to head up the their UFO investigation, uh, and he was offered uh, the return of his security clearance if he would accept the project, and so he did. This was Condon's chief investigator, Roy Craig. Uh, he would play a pivotal role in uh, executing the cover-up. After Ray Fowler contacted Roy Craig about the UFO incidents at the missile sites, they met, and Ray gave him information about the incidents. Craig went to visit Malmstrom to follow up. These are a couple of handwritten notes that Craig made for that visit. In the first note, item 3 refers to the Echo flight incident, but he has the date mixed up. He has the Echo flight shut down on the 24th, but it was on the 16th. The Oscar flight incident was the 24th. In the second note, he refers to a wave of incidents at Malmstrom. He was also given the name of one of the witnesses and refers to the Belt, Montana sighting. The witness, Mr. Rinaldi, saw strange lights twice, about a week apart, during the site, his site activation work, so he would have had, uh, been near the sites in question. I'd like to clarify the timeline of what I just discussed. The con investigation started in late 1966. Uh, the Malmstrom incidents in March of 67. So right away they were faced with, with those major events. Ray Fowler meets with uh, con investigator Roy Craig in the late summer of 67. Craig goes to Malmstrom Air Force Base around October of 67. Now, what I haven't mentioned is that there was a meeting held in June of 1967 with what's called base UFO officers. These were officers uh, identified at various bases across the country uh, the Air Force agreed to make available to help the counted investigators. Uh, more on that later, <clears throat> but these, this particular timeline is important uh, when we're talking about the Air Force cover-up and collusion. This is a photo of Lieutenant Colonel Lewis Chase. He was identified as the base UFO officer by the Air Force during this period. He would have been responsible for working with the Condon investigation. There's no public record that he contacted Condon about the March 16th echo incident. His first known contact with Condon regarding the UFO study was the Belt sighting. Belt, Montana is a small town a short distance southeast of Great Falls. At about 9.30 p.m., Ken Williams was driving his truck north to Great Falls when he noticed a large glowing light flying about a mile away and about 500 to 1,000 feet above the ground. His speed was approximately the same as his. When he stopped to take a better look, it also stopped and flashed its light at him three times. It seemed to him that the object wanted to be noticed. When he walked toward it, it left at high speed. He stopped the motorist and asked they contact the highway patrol. A patrolman, Bud Nader, soon arrived and then the object had returned. This time it was seen by both of them, landing in a ravine called Frenchman Cooley. 
Williams had seen the object up close and wrote that it was dome-shaped and about 20 feet in diameter. The Air Force was also notified, and Colonel Chase was on the scene at about 11 p.m. By then, it appeared that the object had departed. However, broken tree branches were found in the area. Here's a telex on the belt sighting that Chase sent to quite a few Air Force offices, including the Foreign Technology Division at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, the home of the Blue Book Project. Note that he reports there are numerous reports of the object by agencies at Malmstrom. Chase also sent a separate report of the belt sighting to Condon about a week later. Nowhere in that report is there a mention of any impact on the missile sites on that night by UFOs. In fact, that impact of UFOs was well known by many base personnel. Here's the testimony of Robert Jameson, who was called into work on the Oscar flight shutdown on the night of the belt sighting. Jameson, between January 1965 and October of 1967, I was stationed at Malmstrom Air Force Base as a combat missile targeting team commander. Our main job was to point the missiles in the right direction. Also, we may be dispatched from time to time to a restart. In case any missile goes off alert, we have to restart and verify the targeting data. In March 1967, I was on alert for dispatch. And that evening, I got a call from job control saying, the missile going down in Oscar flight, go out and restart it which was nothing unusual up to this point. I called my team, and I went down into the, to the hangar. As soon as I got to the hangar, some acquaintances of mine approached me and says, Bob, do you know what happened? No, I don't know what happened. And he says, well, a missile, a UFO, was sighted over Lewistown, Montana, actually over Roy, Montana. Lewistown's the nearest town of any significance. But over that Lewistown, Roy, Montana, which is the center of Oscar flight. And when that UFO, at the same time that UFO was over there, all of Oscar flight went down. Well, that was highly unusual. I went to job control to verify it, and yes, they confirmed it. And I was looking at the status board they have. Do they have a map, the whole wing? I know that everything was green. All the lights, they have lights for missile sites. All the lights were green except one corner, in the upper right-hand corner, is all red. All of Oscar flight was down. I mentioned to them, that doesn't happen. He says, well, it happened once before, about a week before. A UFO was sighted over Echo Flight, and about the same time, all missiles in Echo Flight went down. He says, other than that and this, this is it. It's never have happened before. Personally, I'm never aware of any two missiles going down at the same time, let alone ten. In Jameson's affidavit, he states clearly that the Oscar flight went down on March 24, 1967. When Craig visited Malmstrom in October 1967 to inquire about the Echo and Oscar UFO incidents, he found Colonel Chase less than cooperative. Chase was surprised he even knew about these events. Chase told Craig that UFOs were not involved in the shutdowns, and there was a classified investigation still in progress to find the cause. And if he wanted to access the report of their investigation, he would have to go through the Air Force Project Coordinator in Washington, D.C. Since Robert Lowe, Conan's deputy, was the only one on the team that had uh, clearance to receive classified information, Lowe would have to make the formal request himself. Craig, as he states in his own account, simply accepted Chase's explanation and turned around and left Malmstrom without further investigation of the echo and honor. When Craig approached Lowe about reviewing this classified report, uh, Lowe told him that he checked with Washington and they told him it would probably be too highly classified for them to review and then they gave him an alternate explanation uh, for the echo shutdown, such as uh, nuclear testing. When in June of 1967 there was a meeting of the Air Force UFO officers with the Condon team, it became evident to Chase that the results of their investigation had been predetermined. 
Here's a record of his notes of that meeting. So although the university study has approximately eight months to run, and barring any dramatic events, the conclusions in the initial formal report will most likely read as follows. There are, is no evidence to support a hypothesis that extraterrestrials have visited the Earth. Finally, the cover-up of the Echo and Oscar incidents were complete when Chase wrote this letter to the UFO Project Office at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in response to their inquiry. It states categorically that there was no equipment malfunction during the UFO sightings. This was a completely false statement, and Chase certainly was well aware it was false. The very fact that he officially hid the truth from another Air Force office shows the extent to which they were going to ensure these highly significant incidents were to be kept highly classified. This is my part of the story, March 24th, 1967. I was on crew with Fred Mywald. Here's a map of the missile field at that time. Uh, it shows Echo and Oscar flight circled. Uh, Oscar was near Roy, Montana. The photograph of Oscar flight. Notice the large front gate. This is where the uh, guard saw the object hovering. Cutaway view of our hardened capsule, about 60 feet underground and highly secured. We were uh, uh, required to stay in the capsule, uh, locked in uh, 24 hours until relieved by another crew. This is a view of the commander's control console. Uh, notice the bank of lights at the top. It would give us the status of our missiles. We had other banks of lights towards the bottom of those columns uh, showing the uh, whether or not there were any incursions at the launch facilities themselves. This is a view of the indicator panel that gave us a readout of the um, uh, status of each missile separately. If we wanted more detail, we could press the button below for any fault uh, details. After I started researching my story, it, it took me nearly two years to locate my actual commander in the capsule. I had had a hard time, like I said, remembering details, and I had forgotten his name, but finally located him, and here's what he said. I don't recall, I just remember <laughs> our side of it. <laughs> yeah. Here's the sequence I remember. I remember receiving a call first, and, and the security guard said, uh, I've seen some UFOs up here flying around, and I said, uh, forget it. You know, I didn't believe them. I kind of hung up on them. And then a little while later, I don't know how long it was, maybe five, ten minutes, maybe longer, uh, they called back, and the guy sounded real scared, and said there was one just outside the front gate. And uh, he, he also said, I recall, that uh, one of the other guards had gotten injured in some way. I, I, don't, I don't think it was from the UFO. I think it was from uh, trying to climb the fence or something like that. Uh, and then I hung up, or he hung up because he had to go. This guard got injured. And then, and then I believe you were either getting up or I woke you up. And then some of our missiles start shutting down. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Is that about how you remember it? Right. Yeah. We got some security alarms and uh, yeah. problems at a couple of the uh, sites. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm sure glad I found you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, on the way back, they lost 
radio contact, and we ended up having to send them back to base earlier. I'm not sure what happened, but I don't think they ever returned to uh, guard duty. And what were they scared about? Well, they had seen these some crazy things. And oh, they, they did? Had, yeah. Did they reported that to you? I, I they reported it to the top side guy. Oh, the top side guy, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, interesting, don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> just to follow up on what Colonel Mywall just said, uh, besides losing the missiles uh, to no go condition, we also had indications of. Uh, intrusion in the launch facilities. So we sent uh, guards out there, they saw the objects again, and that's what Fred just described. They came back uh, very frightened. More details of the incident at uh, Oscar flight and Echo flight are in this book I wrote with James Klotz in 2005. It's called Fated Giant. After Colonel Chase attended the June 6, 1967 meeting with Condon and the other UFO officers, he wrote a summary of the meeting. I don't know who it was sent to, but we do know what it says. As already noted, he wrote the results of the Condon investigation were preordained. Here he writes that there were some 5% of those reports that were very difficult to explain, but that no time was spent discussing them. In fact, there were many other Air Force-related incidents that could have been reviewed by the Con investigation, but they were also ignored. One was a 1968 incident at a Miniman launch site near Minot, North Dakota. Major Brad Runyon was, has testified that while flying a B-52 training mission, he observed a glowing light object that had landed near one of the missile launch facilities. He was later briefed by a general officer that the 20-ton cover for the missile silo had been removed and the perimeter fence crushed. Blue Book Chief Colonel Quintanilla later issued a report that dismissed the sighting as the Star Vega. In fact, Lieutenant Colonel Chase had his own contact with the UFO in 1957 while flying a training mission in an RB-47 with a full crew. He encountered a UFO over the Gulf of Mexico. This is shown in the track here, he took during the three-hour encounter before landing in Kansas. <clears throat> the object harassed his aircraft the entire time. It flew at very high speeds directly at them before stopping on a dime. It flew circles around them, even disappeared and suddenly reappeared in a different location. Most of this uh, much of this encounter was recorded on radar, both airborne and ground. Of course, the crew witnessed it all. After landing, they were met by AFOSI, who interviewed the crew and took all the recorded evidence. The incident remained highly classified. Uh, during the con investigation, Chase asked to see the files. It was discovered they were held in the special classified Blue Book files. Until then, it was not known that Blue Book had even had classified UFO files. Of course, the Condon investigators did not have access to those. <clears throat> the incident, not the evidence, was later declassified only after the Air Force issued a decision to not continue to review or comment on UFO incidents. In 1969, the Air Force issued its final resolution of the UFO question. They decided to discontinue all investigations or public comment on reported UFO incidents. They cited specifically the findings of the University of Colorado study under Condon as rationale for that there was no evidence of extraterrestrial objects flying in our airspace or any threat to our national security from such objects. In light of the evidence I presented, this is exactly the self-serving conclusion the Air Force had orchestrated. I must add that the cover-up, disinformation, and extreme secrecy of this phenomenon does not start or end with the Air Force. In my mind, and many others agree, there must be an international secret community, or cabal, containing the truth of this phenomenon. As early as 1952, Major Don Kehoe, who formed one of the first public UFO groups, suggested the existence of such a group. In a letter from Ray Fowler to Roy Craig, as shown here, he suggested the same. 
In fact, Craig later invited Fowler to join him in a confidential group studying the UFO question. Fowler declined. Uh, I am certainly convinced such a cabal exists. I have even tried to simulate in a sketch how such an organization could be constituted. Uh, I go into more speculative details in my book, Unidentified, the UFO Phenomenon. Our government agencies have managed to hide the reality of the UFO phenomenon simply by refusing to discuss the massive amount of evidence supporting it. With respect to what occurred with our most advanced missiles in 1967, the Air Force admitted the high improbability of the events. They were able to isolate the cause of the shutdowns to a particular piece of equipment, the guidance and control system logic coupler and a particular signal that would have been sent to that piece of equipment in order to upset the guidance system and thereby disable each missile. However, each of the missiles are independent of each other. That particular signal would have had to be sent to each missile by penetrating 60 feet of earth and concrete and then penetrating cable shielded against electromagnetic interference with triple redundancy to all 10 missiles within 10 seconds of each other. Uh, we certainly did not have the technology to produce such a result or such an advanced flying object in 1967. If we had, it would have certainly been revealed by now, 50 years later. The only reasonable conclusion is that these objects were of extraterrestrial origin. There was another incident at Maelstrom that I think further justifies this conclusion. I have had contact with another witness for many years. Because of employment concerns, he's chosen not to reveal his name publicly. I consider him highly credible. I'll call him Tex. Here's his story. After the Echo flight shut down, he was on a targeting crew that was sent to restart the missile that had been disabled. While Tex was in the maintenance bay at one of the sites, shown here, going through his startup procedures, the guard signaled him to come topside. The guard was frightened and pointed to an orange ball of light directly above the site. Tex told the guard to report it and, undeterred, he then proceeded to continue his startup procedure. While going through this procedure with the object hovering above, he would arrive at a particular point in his checklist and the missile systems would shut down. He repeated this process many times and the systems would shut down each time he reached that particular point in his checklist. He was only able to complete the startup procedure when the orange ball left. He also stated that while the object was overhead, he could sense something he described as a rope of static electricity coming down the launch tube. He further concluded that the object must have been closely monitoring his procedures and had an in-depth understanding of how the missile systems worked in order to affect the shutdowns exactly at the time he completed certain checkpoints and during multiple repetitions of those procedures. For him, it was a clear display of their knowledge of our nuclear weapons technology. I think it is long past time to have an honest and open dialogue about this very real phenomenon. If our Congress would simply hold hearings on the evidence available from public testimony on the reality of the UFO phenomenon, that evidence would be overwhelming. I've sent my congressmen and senators a message today with links to these videos. I hope you'll do the same. Thanks.